Well, yeah, we'll start at Columbia Basin Geologic Society and Eastern Washington Department of Geosciences slash Geology. We're kind of in the middle of a merge. Um, we have a monthly meeting, and today we are luckily enough to have Erica Rader from, or Dr. Erica Rader um, from U of I. Um, and, oh, somebody asked, yeah, for a, a field trip link. Um, that's for field camp, um, which is a class usually. That's true. But, we are having an Ice Age flood field trip on May 15th with the Palouse Falls chapter. Not Ooh. that I'm going to yeah, waste Erica's time here, sorry. But then it will be a fun time. Um, but we're lucky, lucky, lucky. Uh, just to say again, thank you to uh, Judd Case. He gave a great talk last month, and it's up on, on YouTube. Um, we'll also have Vic Camp as a sort of a special uh, sneak peek at noon next Thursday um, on the 8th. Uh, or no, that next Thursday. Yeah, next Thursday. Um, he just had a paper come out in GSA uh, today. And so I emailed him and, and he said he would be more than happy to come and give us a Zoom talk um, at noon next Thursday. Uh, so we'll do that as well. But today we are lucky, lucky, lucky people to have uh, Erica Rader. And if I hope you checked out her Reebly uh, website before, it's amazing publications. Um, you'd know that she graduated with honors from Colgate in geology, uh, went on to Alaska, and then graduated with a PhD uh, at U of I. Uh, with, I, you have, with Denny, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the uh, final, wonderful. the final one of the, the Dennis Geist <laughs> line. Denny, okay, guys. Um, and then went off to become a, a famous NASA geologist. Um, and it just got our first uh, NSF grant right now. I'm pretty excited. I've been looking forward to this. We've been trying to get Erica to talk to us for a long time now. And then COVID happened and this and that happened. And uh, I am very excited to stop talking and have Erica Rader talk about splat. Thank you. Okay. That was, I am uh, feeling very accomplished after that kind introduction. So yes, I am gonna to talk to you guys today about the research that I do and how the field work that I've done in uh, Southern Idaho and then some other, a couple of other places, including the field work that we are gonna do next year in Iceland got delayed because of the pandemic, but um, I'll still incorporate that into the story but how that field work is actually telling us something about how the volcanoes on Mars and on the moon could have uh, actually erupted, how that would have looked, and if maybe they interacted with water. And we all care about water on the, uh, oops, here we go, water on Mars because we care about life on other planets and whether there could have been life on other planets. And we also care about what the climates of other planets were um, sometimes people think that maybe if we learned that Mars used to be just as lush as Earth and then there was life on it and then those life creatures did something to make the climate change so drastically that the planet died, um, maybe that would help us get our act in line for our own planet. But um, there's a lot of re cool reasons why we want to know whether there was water on Mars and how much and if it was frozen or if it was liquid. So the way that people started doing this is they started looking at landforms on Mars. So on the left, we have a satellite image of some uh, cone shaped features on Mars. And on the right, we have some cone shaped features on Earth. We have a lot more information about what the ones on Earth, um, why they formed the way that they did. So the idea is that, hey, if we can find similarities between the way these things look, um, maybe the measurements that we have of them, can we s figure out without having to, you know, spend as much time and money as we have spent on the rocks on Earth, can we figure out these interesting questions about was there water on Mars? And so these features that I'm showing you here on, on the right on Earth, they're called rootless cones. And they're oftentimes made of spatter. So uh, this talk is mostly about spatter. So we're gonna go through, I'm gonna tell you what spatter, excuse the animals. Uh, let me tell you what spatter is and also how it's gonna tell us about um, these, these interesting topics on Mars and how we're gonna use experiments in addition to field work to figure out um, what's going on uh, on at least the spatter deposits in Idaho, and then can we then take that information from Idaho and apply it to Mars? So first up, what is spatter? So here's the uh, a couple of main components when, that we see at volcanic landscapes. 
Um, we have uh, the lava, that's a very common one. And there's smooth lava in the front and there's this sort of rubbly uh, um, uh -uh lava in the middle. And then we have the vent in the background is this cone shape and the uh, fine grain material, this is a sort of cinder material and it's grouped into the term tephra. And then spatter is this, this uh, more blobby material you see at the top that forms kind of a, a cliff, a little bit steeper. Um, and so this is a, a, a feature of these cones um, that we find at volcanic centers. And so the definition of spatter is basically uh, the, uh, let's see, I'm trying to move my bars here, um, an accumulation of fluid clasts. So these things are partially molten here and they can be thrown around. They have to, they have to be thrown to be spatter, but they still can retain some shape that they originally had when they got thrown around. So um, if they're too goopy, they'll merge together and turn into a lava flow. And if they're too hard, then they'll turn into a little fragment, uh, say a piece of cinder. And so here's a little video of the mechanism that creates um, spatter class. So you have gas bubbles and those bubbles pop. And then you see these tendrils here forming. This is a soap bubble, so the liquid is uh, so if you have a bunch of those spatter bombs piled up, you get a thing called a spatter deposit. And oftentimes it has this sort of lumpy texture. So that's what spatter is. Now, what can spatter tell us? And I've already kind of hinted at this, but one of the cool things that it can tell us is what kind of environment it may have formed in. So we're gonna talk about these two major environments and there's obviously a range from, you know, the primary event to the secondary event, but in this case, we have a primary vent. This is where magma is actually reaching the surface. And that's where a lot of the gas bubbles are getting uh, exploding here. So that's why we get a big piles of spatter um, at these locations. The secondary vent is when you have gas bubbles blowing up again, but those gas bubbles are not connected to the magmatic system. So in this case, you can see the lava flowed into this uh, lake here or some sort of water feature and that water flashes to steam and then those bubbles are forced through the lava in a, a secondary explosion. So you can get spatter bombs that are formed there as well. The other reason spatter is so important and can tell us things is because it's one of the few ways that we can identify vents in volcanoes that are um, very large and very productive. So this is the Columbia River flood basalts. I'm sure you have all heard of them. And this is a type of volcano that oozed out so much lava that it never made any sort of um, high point cone shape, easily identifiable edifice vent where the material came out of. However, we really wanna know where the material came out of. Um, so the way that we can find this is we have all these, um, these fissures here. These are vent locations that were, um, that were mapped out based uh, largely on uh, the, the, the actually identifying areas of spatter. So if you find spatter, you might have found the vent. However, you might have also found a secondary vent. So those two things are pretty interesting. Um, here in this case, this is a group of potential secondary vents. You can see there's some arrows here pointing out and this is on, uh, this is on, let's see, the moon here, I believe. Oh, Elysium rise. No, this is on, this is on Mars. Sorry. Um, so this is a region where we have volcanic lava flows, but we also have a bunch of different um, vents that could have A, could have spatter, and B, could actually be secondary vents, which would indicate that there was some other source of water. So, okay, why do we care about basaltic spatter? This is the, the type of eruption that produces these things, um, these spatter deposits, are actually on basically every rocky planet in our solar system. So we got the, and moon. So we got the moon and Mercury, we got Venus and Mars. And um, all of these are predominantly basalt. So we know that there's a bunch of basalt. We know that they all have these volcanic eruptions, but we don't really know 
how long those eruptions were going for. We don't know um, if they were exactly like the way that things erupt on Earth. Uh, so there's a lot of questions that spatter could potentially answer um, if we find that we can actually uh, get close enough to it and good enough pictures of it to do some of these analyses. So spatter, I mentioned this before about how spatter is kind of the Goldilocks of basaltic morphologies because it's can't have it be too hot and you can't have it be too cold. It's this nice in-between zone. Um, if you have it be too hot, then you uh, will, it'll pile up and turn into a lava flow and flow away. And if you have it too cold, then it will form into chunks that don't actually fuse together. And the reason this is, is because of this property about lava, it forms this coating and the coating is actually pretty deformable until it gets cold enough that it, that it freezes. And the, that temperature is called the glass transition temperature. That's where you can no longer deform that material. You can no longer anneal the glass pieces together. So spatter is in this Goldilocks zone. It hasn't reached glass transition temperature yet, but it has this nice rind on it. So when these blobs fall on top of each other, they can begin to stick together um, depending on how much heat you have and how much time you have. Oh, and here's just a nice little video of some of these little spatter bombs getting thrown out. And you can see, uh, you know, they break up in the air. They break up sometimes when they land on the spatter deposit. Um, and basically some places they are accumulating very quickly and some places they're not really accumulating very fast at all. So when we have this, this difference in accumulation rate, we can see that that's going to affect the temperature. If you have really fast accumulation, you're having a lot of heat being put into the system and you're gonna have a much slower cooling rate. Whereas if you only have a couple of blobs being thrown out, you're gonna have um, a much faster cooling rate. So this is the relationship between accumulation rate and cooling rate. We kind of expect to see uh, faster accumulations having slower cooling rates. So this has a tie into the field. Well, when you go into the field and you go to these spatter deposits, one thing that we noticed is that if you pull on these, these, these clasts, in some places they're stuck together. So you can see this is an outline of a place where a clast had been stuck on the bottom side of this deposit. And when I pulled on it, a little piece broke off because this piece is actually fused to this piece. But the rest of this, uh, there, there's a little piece here that was fused, but the rest of it wasn't fused. So the strength of how stuck together these things are seems to be related to um, maybe that temperature and that cooling rate. This was the hypothesis. So we talked a bit about cooling rate and accumulation rate and how these different deposits um, can reflect that. So the idea here is we have a graph that's gonna have accumulation rate increasing as you go up on this side, and you have cooling rate increasing as you go up on this side. And then we have three examples of eruption styles here. So up here we have uh, eruptions that are fountaining material, but it's accumulating so fast that you're getting these flows coming out of it. Um, so that's a very high accumulation rate. On the other end of the spectrum here, we have a very high cooling rate. So here we have little uh, solid flecks. They're still hot, but they're not hot enough. They're not above that glass transition temperature um, enough that when they land, they're gonna cool faster um, because maybe you don't have as many of them and you're gonna have uh, a, a different style of eruption, right? Than you have with this kind of fountaining eruption. This is sort of more uh, like fireworks, sort of a big explosion and then little pieces go flying everywhere. This is where we start to see a little bit of a different behavior. We have an explosion and it's still launching these pieces out, but you can see that these are tendrils now. So we're getting that fluid component and those are going to be plopped onto the side here. And uh, if you do that fast enough, maybe you'll eventually get a flow. But if you do it, if your accumulation rate is slow enough, then you're going to get uh, a spatter deposit. So here's what these things kind of look like. Right here's we have our big lava flows, our um, Columbia River flood basalt lava flows. Over here where we have high cooling rates, we have those cinder pieces, those pieces of tephra. 
And then here are uh, some droplets of spatter deposits um, that were still fluid enough to hold their shape, um, but they were molten enough to stick to each other. So you can see as we go up in cooling rate, we are going to, you know, eventually you cool so much, you're gonna get cinder no matter what. And eventually with accumulation rate, you accumulate so much, you're gonna get lava flows no matter what. But cooling, but, but the spatter deposits are constrained on all sides, either by uh, nothing happening, right? You have no accumulation or you have no cooling going on, um, or you eventually cross over into these other morphologies. So we have this, this diagram here with these uh, kind of arbitrary lines. And what I wanted to do was put some numbers on this diagram. Can we figure out what, what cooling rate does spatter turn into tephra and what accumulation rate does spatter turn into lava flow? So if we can do this, then that means we might be able to quantify eruption rates of ancient eruptions that we don't have any data for other than what the deposits look like. Maybe we can figure out if uh, there was, you know, a primary versus a secondary vent because the spatter looks a little bit different in those two eruptive environments. We might be able to tell if uh, a eruption increased in vigor and suddenly started fountaining really violently because the deposit looks different. Or maybe we can even see if there was some kind of water or ice on a place like Mars where even if we don't have any sedimentary rocks that are telling us, oh, this was a lake deposit, um, then we, we still might be able to say, well, even though we don't have a lake deposit, we did have enough water here to create a fast cooling situation or maybe just enough water to create secondary vents. This is actually a secondary vent uh, and an Icelandic eruption. So these are all sort of the big questions. Now, how do we get down to it? We had to do a bunch of experiments, right? Because while there are active eruptions currently throwing spatter bombs in the air, it is not particularly safe to go up to them and stick their milk couples in them, even though people are flying drones into them right now. I don't know if anyone's watching this Icelandic eruption, but there are videos all over the internet of people flying drones basically right into the spatter fountains. So that's cool, but not something that I A, had funding for or B, had access to uh, approximately three years ago when I did these experiments. So instead we wanted to do nice controlled experiments and we wanted to see if the physical characteristics that we hypothesized were related to uh, accumulation rate and cooling rate really were. So some of the things we wanted to measure were, okay, these are a bunch of spatter bombs and this is a schematic of a hotter diagram versus, or a hotter deposit versus a cooler deposit. And for hotter deposits, we assume that there would be more connections. We uh, hypothesize that the class would be more flattened. So you'd have a, a wider um, di direction in this, this way, and then a shorter um, width in this direction compared to the cooler deposits. And we would also have less void space. So you could see that the spaces between the clasts here is what we're talking about for void space. And so if you have a colder deposit, you're not gonna be able to deform and squeeze out that airspace. That's the, the hypothesis. Oops, sorry, my font got messed up here. How to make spatter bombs. So here is the apparatus that we used. This is a um, large bronze casting furnace that has been repurposed to do um, molten rock experiments. And this is at Syracuse University. And uh, this is sort of some of the team that helped me do the experiments here. Okay, so this is the, the, the difficulty here of uh, what we were trying to do. Um, you can see we started with a leaf blower and we didn't really achieve, achieve much success. We're definitely getting those tendrils, right? And we are definitely making um, a feature that actually does exist. It's called Pele's hair and Pele's tears, um, but that is not, they weren't quite lumpy enough. Um, so we went on to trial number two. Oh, here we go, right. So this was the spatter cone we were trying to make. This was the spatter cone that we actually made did not achieve the goals. So we had to kind of reframe what we were trying to do. We basically needed the blob component to be bigger because we wanted the same size spatter bombs as we were seeing in nature to make sure we were getting the thermal conditions right. So the next thing we tried to do was fill up a uh, little air cannon here 
and launch it out with just some air pressure. Uh, you can see here that we did make a very nice bomb, but it was uh, a little bit too, too rigid, right? It, it didn't really deform quite well enough. You can see it, it does actually leak out a bit here, but we, weren't, we still weren't achieving things. So we thought, okay, well, we'll just speed it up a little bit, give it kind of less time, and then the air cannon should work great. Um, but there were some problems with this method and uh, we ended up not using it again because there were some vehicles that were damaged in the process of this experiment. Uh, I do not recommend doing this at home. Uh, I do not think that this provides good data. So we moved on from this technique and instead, oops, 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 back. Instead, we decided to do something a little less explosive which was filling up the container and then moving it onto a uh, forklift, raising it up and then dropping it down on the ground. And that's supposedly getting this sort of impact. But as you can see, getting those fine details of, is it hot enough? Okay, is it landing in the right place? Is it rolling away? Turned out to be really challenging to get that uh, on top of that pile. Ah, oh, so we nailed one. But you can see that that still, this does not look the way that these deposits look like. So we needed something even more controlled. And what we decided to do was get rid of the launching component. No more firing things out of cannons, no more trying to drop things. And instead we were just gonna control place those clasps on top of each other. So we started to focus on getting those clasps really realistic. And what, what I'm doing here is I'm mushing in gravel into this molten material. And this gravel is the same chemical composition. It's the same stuff that is actually molten here. But by doing that, we're, we're able to get uh, the, the right shape, you know, the right kind of rheology. This material is deforming the same amount that those bombs deform, as well as a good thermal heterogeneity throughout the bomb. So we're losing that sort of impact aspect, but what we are gaining is um, at getting the right thermal conditions. And you can see this, these bombs continue to deform even under their own weight. So here's what, we have these little spatter piles. They look much more realistic compared to some of the uh, previous stuff that we made. And we have thermal couples sticking inside of those um, those bombs, right, right in, in the, the, the very uh, connection between them. So just to prove to you that these look a little bit more similar, um, these are the same, uh, same, basically same size, still have the kind of droopiness. Um, these are, you know, 2000 to 7000 years older. So they have lichens and things and slightly more weathered. But um, we're still getting the, we're definitely getting the right kind of shapes and sizes with our experiments. So the data that we collected, we had a couple of different things. We wanted to look at the, this is the data from the thermocouples. And so we had one thermocouple between the bottom and the top, or the bottom and the middle class, and then one thermocouple between the middle and the top class. And so we were looking for the high temperature. We were looking for that cooling rate. And we were looking at this uh, other important factor, which is time above 700 degrees, which is the, the glass transition temperature that we're using for this composition of material. So these are the, the three things that we used to characterize the cooling rate of um, the clasts. In addition, we were able to look at the high temperature from the outside, um, right as those clasps are being placed on top of each other using a forward-looking infrared camera. So the, um, after these clasps cooled, we had one more piece of data that we collected, and that was to pull those uh, clasps apart and look for all of the places that they actually fused together. So that's, yeah, we call that the fused surface area. Um, and the, you can see here that those, those patches look a little bit different than the sort of nice shiny places or the impressions where even though it was touching, um, it wasn't actually fusing together. So we have here the, the F value, which is the cross section of a clast. Um, we care about the cross section because this is what you actually see in the deposit. It's very hard to accurately pull apart 
every little spatter class. So we usually just cut them in half and we see, okay, if we were to cut this in half, what proportion of that perimeter would have been fused compared to unfused? So this is a percentage that represents how fused those samples were. So uh, the bottom here are our experiments and the top are natural samples. So you can kind of compare these properties that we were trying to mimic. We were able to create these hollow cores. So these things will have bubbles blown in them. Um, and, and our samples also blew bubbles. So that was good. This definitely affects the, um, the, the way that heat is transferred through that deposit. Similarly, we found that we could create a more vesiculated core compared to a dense rim. Here's that more vesiculated core and then our dense rim here. And obviously there's a very, there's a, there's a wide range in nature of how vesiculated these things can get. So um, the fact that these aren't identical is totally fine. It's just that pattern is really important that we can achieve that. When we look at the, um, the, the texture of the crystals um, and the glass, we were actually able to find that we were, we were creating the same types of textures. So um, this, this sort of matte looking uh, luster uh, instead of like an obsidian glass luster, uh, we were able to get that when we could, when we added this gravel in, it allowed places for the crystals to nucleate off of and we were able to get that same uh, kind of uh, external texture. And when we looked at those in the microscopes, we were able to see that those crystals were growing in the same kind of way, kind of very needle-like needle crystals that are pretty characteristic of rapid cooling. These are a lot smaller. Um, if you'll notice, the um, magnifications are quite different. Uh, so there's certainly some work to do to, to make that a little bit more accurate. But the fact that we were getting crystals was a big step up because previously they hadn't really been able to generate crystals in this way at the Syracuse Lava Project. Uh, okay, this is shiny blue coating and uh, bread crust tear tears in spatter bomb rinds. These are both features that we found in the field that we were actually able to recreate uh, kind of unintentionally, right, just from the stresses of moving the bombs around. And uh, we still don't really have any idea about this blue, shiny blue coating. This is kind of a cool thing that um, until you know what it's telling you, it doesn't really matter. So this is a project that I hope to one day conquer, but uh, for now it is just a, a neat thing that we were able to mimic. Okay, so the whole point was to find these, uh, these borders between spatter and tephra and spatter and flow. So we throw our data on here, the fused class. So these are spatter bombs that uh, where it would have been able to make spatter deposits are the red and the unfused spatter. So these are bombs that still weren't hot enough to actually um, stick together. So they would have made maybe more of a tephra deposit. Uh, these are in black. And you can see that the cooling rates associated with the, um, and sorry, the scale got a little wonky here uh, because of this text issue that I had, but at any rate, you can look at the paper if you really want the exact absolute values. Um, the most of, so many of these unfused class plotted in that Tefra zone. So they were cooling so fast that they couldn't um, actually achieve the, the, the temperatures needed to make a spatter deposit. But you can see that there's a whole bunch of them that were not cooling particularly quickly, but they still had, uh, they still weren't able to fuse together. And so there's two reasons for this. One, they were at a lower accumulation rate, so they just didn't have that heat to start off with. And two, if we look at the temperatures that they were, we, this can actually be seen um, with the two temperatures that we took. Remember, we took the surface temperature with the infrared camera, and then we had the, um, the thermocouple, which is where we got this time above 700 degrees. And you can see all of the fused samples had much higher surface temperatures and had this sort of this 26 to 30 minutes above 700 degrees to sit there and actually fuse together. So this seemed like a pretty pretty well-constrained boundary here. That you needed to achieve these, um, these conditions to get a spatter deposit. 
Okay, so now I'm going to show you a bunch of graphs that are going to look at, do we actually see more connections? Do we actually see more squashed clasts? And do we actually see less void space in all of these hotter deposits? So first we'll do fused clasts. And the scale here is uh, there should actually be black at the bottom, which is zero, but then 1% to 60% fused. And the uh, axes here, we have time above 700 degrees Celsius and then the high temperature from the FLIR. And so you can see that all of these unfused ones are at the lower temperatures and had not very much time even above that 700 degrees to actually uh, get. Uh, so yeah, all of these ones that are below 700, they just have zero time, obviously, to spend above 700 degrees. But as you go up in this direction, you're rising up in this scale and you're going through 1%, then you get into the sort of 10 to 15%, and then the 25%, and then uh, we have our 60%. So you can see that those, those rapidly um, accelerate to very well fused at those higher temperatures. And these are two other ways to look at the data. This incorporates cooling rate. And cooling rate's a little bit less clear. Um, so that's why this, this graph is kind of the best. I should probably just, people are interested in cooling rate because I tell you to be interested in cooling rate. But um, the, all three of these graphs will be shown for the next couple of slides. So basically, the amount of fusion between class is dependent on that starting temperature. That's really important as well as how much time you have above 700 degrees C, which is related to cooling rate, but isn't entirely dependent on it, it turns out. So what about the squashed? Okay, so dark colors here are very round and light colors here are uh, very flat. And so you can see this data is a little bit less clear. We have some pretty round clasts um, at higher temperatures and higher times above 700 degrees and we have some pretty flat clasts um, that are also at pretty low temperatures. So what this is telling us is that the uh, cooling rate is weakly correlated. You know, if you, if you kind of um, look at a transect through this portion of the graph, you have darker um, colors at the bottom and you go up to lighter colors, but it is not perfect. Um, and part of this is because the flight of the clasts, when I would pick them up with the tongs and move them over, would um, deform the clasts. So there's some kind of, there, there was uh, some human interference with, with the shape of these clasts that we can assume um, is not happening in the natural setting. So that's something to be improved upon in future um, trials. Okay, what about void space? So void space actually works pretty well. Again, darker um, colors mean uh, more void space. So darker colors at these lower temperatures, we get a lot more void space and we go up to basically totally wedged together clasts at the top. So this is, this is a really good correlation um, with what we would have expected. And it actually shows pretty good with the cooling rate here as well compared to the time above 700 degrees Celsius. So if you have higher heat, you should really have less void space in your clasts or in your deposit. So we have, uh, I just sort of said all these things. So more squashed, more fusion, less void space in your hotter, hotter deposits. So uh, in this term F value, I use this later. So F value, high F value means you have more fusion and it's a pretty good proxy for temperature. Oops. Okay, so now we're gonna apply this to real deposits. We did the experiments, we figured out what these relationships are and now we're gonna go look at the spatter at Craters of the Moon. I don't really have to tell you all, well, maybe I do since we're actually kind of far from it, but Southern Idaho, sort of in the Eastern part, you can see it from afar from space, it's this very nice, very large uh, eruption, eruption field. And it's super cool, you should definitely go if you can. Has nice spatter events as well as uh, lots and lots of lava flow cinder cones. Here's a nice big cinder cone. Uh, tree molds, beautiful blue lava with beautiful flowers. It's really great, you should definitely go if you get a chance. Um, and here is the 2018 eruption uh, from Hawaii. And this is basically probably what it looked like. 
of course, we are learning more and more and realizing that this um, this is actually probably less explosive than what Craters of the Moon was. Now that we're seeing some of these Hawaii or these Icelandic eruptions, they're looking a little bit more similar to what the deposits look like in in um, Idaho. But at any rate, this had just happened when I made that and the Iceland eruption had not happened. So this is the footage you get to see. And so there's this big vent, right? And it's kind of spitting out some spatter. This cone is so well formed now that no spatter is really getting out anymore. Um, and instead it's very much lava flow dominant. So the spatter deposits, what we would do is we would go up to them and we would find a nice place where we can see the outlines of these clasts. And sometimes that's as easy as, you know, saying, oh, okay, you can really see it here. But sometimes you had to work uh, pretty hard to figure out where those boundaries were. And we had to use the pattern of vesicles to help us. So remember that the inside of those clasts oftentimes have much bigger vesicles. To go over, we measure every single class, measure the amount of fusion that we see on them, measure how big the vesicles were um, and, and the aspect ratio of those clasts. So there's the aspect ratio. We would note if it had a big void space in it because that was something that we saw was pretty common in a lot of these deposits. Um, and then of course that F value. So how much fusion was there between those clasts? And so this is all the data from Craters of the Moon. So F value, remember, is a proxy for temperature. So increasing this way means a hotter deposit for whatever reason, be it higher accumulation rate or be it um, from lower cooling rate. And then we have class aspect ratio, the long axis, so how big that bomb was, and the percent of void space in the deposit. And here's the relationship that we expected, right? These we hypothesized class aspect ratio should go down as you have a higher temperature. Um, the axis, you have bigger bombs, that should mean you have more heat being put into the system. So uh, as you go to higher F value, we should see that go up. And then void space, we expected to see that go down. And here's what the real data look like. Uh, you can see the error bars are quite large. They're not actually error bars in the sense that we were, there's any mistake being made or you know uncertainty. What it is, is a reflection of how much variability there was in that deposit. So some clasts were really well fused together and some were not. The places where the dots are, are the average of the overall deposit. And we found that there were three categories of sort of morphologies. That primary vent, um, that's where the actual magma was reaching the surface. Secondary vents, which um, were actually a little bit cooler um, than the primary vents. And then we have these non-eruptive fissures. So these are spatter deposits that uh, were deposited far from the vent and then a big crack went through. So you still see the spatter and therefore you might interpret it as a vent. But um, when you look at the amount of fusion between those bombs, you'll see that they're really, really low. And so it couldn't have been a primary or a secondary vent. It had to be this kind of um, this chunk that was removed from the vent in some way, shape or form. The, uh, the long axis data and the void space data is not quite as good. Um, the long axis data is not too bad, but uh, basically bigger bombs did result in higher temperatures. But the void space is interesting. In the primary data, the primary event, that, that did seem to be true. We still had reduced void space as we got to hotter deposits. But the, um, the secondary vent and the non-eruptive fissure, that was not the case. Um, oftentimes these bombs were um, actually a little bit smaller. And so they, and you can kind of see that here, especially for the non-eruptive vent. And so if you have smaller things, you can actually pack them into those void spaces a lot easier. So that's some of what's going on here. Okay, so, oh yeah, so this, this um, F value, we kind of made a cutoff here, this uh, average of the F value for the primary vent was about 40, for the secondary vent was about 20, and for the non-eruptive fissure is, uh, you know, 1% is what we were looking at here. Then here's examples of those three characteristics, the primary vent, 
the secondary event, this was a little spatter deposit over owl caverns. And then a non-eruptive fissure. Um, these are spatter bombs that are fused, not very fused, but a little bit fused together. But this vent was never eruptive. This was a, a crack that formed um, after deformation occurred in the area. So if we take these characteristic values and we compare them now with um, our experiments, we have our uh, F values here that are color coded. We can see that if we put our primary vent spatter, that was our 40%, that's way up here. Um, we can get a cooling rate and a time above 700 degrees C. And we look at our secondary vents, those are closer to 20 and our non-eruptive fissures down here, closer to that zero mark. So you can see just how much different uh, amount of time these different deposits spent uh, at those different temperatures. We can do the same thing with our um, FLIR data and get our landing temperatures, right? Cause we don't, you know, a lot happens in the air. So we, we didn't take that into consideration just what temperature was it when it finally hit the ground. And you can see it ranges quite a bit, but we can get a um, hundred degree difference between our, our non-eruptive fissures oops, and our primary vents, for example. So now we have some quantitative data that we can throw into models uh, and that's what modelers love. They want data to uh, kind of use as benchmarks. Okay, so I have set up this very long story to tell you if there was water on Mars and where and how much. And now I'm gonna show you that we haven't done that part of the project yet. But uh, the, the, what we have done is developed this method that will allow us to identify features like this and say, hey, okay, uh, if we can go up to these things, this is Iceland again, um, and we're gonna go to Iceland this next summer, not this upcoming one, but the one after, to actually collect data on these features. Um, and oh yeah, the whole point of this, right? These things are really, these are distributed, right? They're, they're kind of all over the place, the shotgun pattern. That is the, the logic that people are using to say that these are rootless cones and therefore evidence of water, which is true <laughs> in this case. But if we look at a satellite image of, um, this is, I believe is the Penacates in, um, Northern Mexico, right, right on the border with Arizona. And you can see all of these spots here. These, it's a shotgun pattern for sure. And these are all vents and they are all primary vents. So that distribution of vents is not a good enough reason to say that there was water on Mars. What we really need is to get our noses into these deposits and uh, that can be done by a little uh, astronaut or perhaps a rover we're developing that technology now to be able to do things like this just from images alone. And we should be able to say, oh yeah, here's the here's where um, the new rover landed. Uh, and this is pretty cool because this is a large delta of a uh, crater that formed from an impact. And in that impact, there was also generation of melt. So if there's any volcanoes that may have erupted um, into or flowed into this lake, we should see evidence of that. And hopefully this new rover will find it and make all of my dreams come true. Because if it can get pictures of these deposits, we'll be able to actually say, oh, that's primary spatter or hmm, that's secondary spatter. Uh, and with the data from Iceland, we might be able to say whether the, uh, amount of fusion that we see is because of the temperature being low due to water. And uh, oh yeah, so these, these are sort of the grand conclusions here, right? Um, the, the, the numbers that we got, they're not particularly important until you can apply them to something. And those, the deposits that we want to apply them to uh, are the ones that we don't have pictures of yet from Mars. So. Hopefully, we will be able to identify whether these features on Mars are secondary spatter or if they are uh, primary eruptive cones and therefore has a very different kind of tectonic structure um, under, underneath where those volcanoes are compared to what we think is going on right now. Um, okay. This is all kind of unnecessarily related since these are 
uh, we're doing these, okay, so basically we're doing these studies on some of the Hawaii eruptions, and we're gonna be doing these same types of studies um, at Iceland next year to compare the sort of water versus not water rich deposits. Uh, okay, what, what is my time? I haven't looked. Let's see. Let's see if we can one. Okay, I think that should be good then. Let's stop there. And questions? <laughs> um, first off, there's the CBGS Nailed It Award for your Pay Layers hair. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we don't have any money because we don't charge dues, but yeah. Um, we had two questions on the chat, and if anybody else would like to put some questions up on chat or the QA, um, we can also unmute people if they'd like to speak and ask a question in person and don't type um, too much, since it has been a long day probably for everybody. Um, the first question, though, from Amy is, can you tell us the citation for the Mars volcanic map with the potential secondary cones or the rootless cones? <laughs> Ah, yes, thank you, Amy. Um, let's see if I included that information a year ago when I made this <laughs> pre-pandemic. Um, let's see, this was, I believe you're asking about this figure. This is the one, right? Uh, and it looks like I did not include that information. Maybe I cropped it. Oh, 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 oh no. Nope, doesn't include that in the uh, crop. So this is from a publication <laughs> for sure. Um, and I can attempt to find it and email it to Chad. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we can Google Tartarus Coles. Yes. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Uh, and then the second one, you just had mentioned you're going to go to Iceland again and kind of do the same thing. Um, but how do you think it's going to be compared to your graphs you're kind of showing as far as spatter and Ooh, yeah, that's a great question. All scientists should be asking themselves these types of things. So what I am really hoping this will show is, let me share my screen again. So what I'm hoping is that we will find that the primary event of Icelandic material will fall in this range, right? It might be a little bit cooler um, because Iceland has a slightly thicker crust than uh, sort of in different places. It's a little bit different than Hawaii. Um, it's unlikely that it will be hotter than Hawaii, but it might be a little bit cooler. But what we're hoping is that the secondary vents will be even cooler um, than the primary events in Iceland. So I would, I would expect to see the same relationship, but shifted slightly. And maybe we'll see a better relationship in the void space because once you kind of get, um, one, the, the spatter deposits that are there are not much smaller than the primary spatter. So I think we might, we might see a slightly better relationship with the void space. But that is only what we hope to see and uh, I've done enough science to know that sometimes we don't we don't get what we want. So stay tuned. <laughs> All right, we got a couple in the uh, Q and A. Um, Phil Moyle says, "I'm sure you're familiar with the blue dragon flow at craters. Um, how might that compare to the bluish color you observed in the cooled melt?" Yes. Yeah, so yes, exactly. The bluish color that I showed you is from the blue dragon flow. There's also, there's a couple of flows in Craters of the Moon that have that. And the idea is that that comes from a very high titanium iron oxide uh, smattering of minerals. Um, I have some neat pictures of those, but basically there are these little globules of iron titanium oxide. And because there's the titanium in them, they give that kind of blue color. The material that we were using at the, the experiments doesn't have a particularly high amount of titanium. 
what what seemed to correlate with the blue coloring in our experiments was if we had a lot of water sort of steam getting trapped inside of the in between those clasts so to me that suggests that there's something more important about the oxidation state of those oxides compared to the amount of titanium so maybe it's, you know, there's not sort of a level of titanium that you need. You just need to have it be present at the time of a lot of oxygen. And so that's kind of an interesting idea because mostly on earth that oxygen, like, yes, we have atmospheric oxygen, but a lot of that really comes from water. So if we end up finding a blue coating on Mars, that would be, I would make a very strong case for there was significant water involved, um, at least steam-wise, in that eruption. Very neat. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Spokane USGS's own new uh, geologist, Catherine Watts, asked, why is Craters of the Moon there? It's so young for that setting. Yeah, so Craters of the Moon is a really fun uh, intersectional uh, eruption spot. And actually, I'll show you the picture of the map again, because then you will believe me when I tell you this. Um, it is uh, tens of thousands of years younger than the previous eruptions in the area. Well, not the previous mafic eruptions. There's, there's kind of a, a smattering of basalt, but of, um, here we go but of the Yellowstone eruptions, it's a lot younger. So this whole, this whole flat part, uh, you can maybe see it better in this picture. This is the, the Snake River Plain, right? And that's sort of tracking to the Yellowstone hotspot here. So when the Yellowstone hotspot was here, it was multiple millions of years before, before this eruption uh, occurred. And so, what this is, oh, actually, let's go back here. The other geological thing that's happening here, though, is that the, the hotspot track has a, a, a legacy underneath the surface, a very warm crust. So even though the main driving heat source is here, this stuff is still pretty toasty. So it doesn't need much to have it go off. The, the sort of ignition of this eruption is the evidence of that is what you can see on either side of the hotspot track, which is the basin and range terrain. So we have rifting going on in this, this part. So we have this pulling apart because the, the plates are pulling apart and because they're pulling apart in a spot where the lithosphere is really hot still from the, the remnants of that hotspot track, we get eruptions that uh, often come out of these fissures, which are aligned with the basin and range orientation in the area. So yeah, we just need a little more extension and maybe we'll get another one. All right. Um, Lucas Everts, great uh, EW Geology alumni. Woo. I'm at a question. Regarding the deformation of spatter, how significant is the influence of gravity on the, mm. like Mars or the moon, how would that change the, the, the cooling rates and shapes the class? Yeah, I think I may have added that at the end of this. Oh no, I just like did Hawaii stuff like crazy. Um, so yeah, the, the effect of gravity is significant. On the moon, it's uh, like a third of earth. So basically the easy calculation is if you get a one meter deposit on earth, you're gonna get a three meter deposit on the moon. Um, but no one's really modeled that before. So we don't really know how, how these fluids would, would behave differently. Maybe when we go back to the moon, someone will bring a large furnace and we'll pour out lava on there and see what, what, how it differs. Um, but that's not in the, the works yet. The, Difference in gravity on Mars is, is a little bit, it's closer to Earth. Um, so it probably, it, it would definitely be a thing you'd want to factor in um, when we start making those measurements one day. Very cool. Um, Suki has a question. Couldn't the temperature of primary versus secondary be deciphered through the petrography rather than all the fun fake lava? 
but which I loved, by the way. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. So there, that's a good point. There's a couple of different ways to to actually measure what the cooling rate was, and petrography is one. And then there's this other thing called calorimetry, which is done on the glass. So you take little flecks of the glass and you put it into this machine that slowly heats it up and measures how quickly that heat is being transferred through that component. And I don't understand the physics of it, but at some point uh, it suddenly drops off and where it drops off, that's the temperature. Uh, You can basically calculate the cooling rate from that. The reason why this is a better technique, even though it is way less accurate, is because we can just do it simply from pictures. If we could go and collect as many rocks as we wanted and make thin sections and do all of the analyses on them, it would obviously be a much better way to do it. But this is kind of like the quick and dirty, you know, now we have a little helicopter up there. We can be like, hey, helicopter, go over there, take that picture, and we will figure it out after that. We don't need you to spend a bunch of time collecting stuff and spending a bunch of money shipping it back to the United States. Seems legit. Good. Oh, Catherine. Um, Catherine asks again, why aren't there more of these uh, lava flows like craters in the moon? Um, there's lots of basin range overprinting the, the Snake River Plain. So why aren't there more of these lava flows in the Snake River Plain? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. So there's actually quite a few. The craters of the moon is is uniquely large, but that's only because of its age. Um, if you if you ever f- if you fly around with Google Earth as much as I do, uh, you can actually see there's the same kind of snaky shapes underneath the grasses of the older parts of the Snake River Plain. And you know they're not that much older, but the the lavas there are just really really thick. So uh, I think it's it's a it's a sampling thing with what we are able to see given the rate of soil processes on the Snake River Plain. And I think, you know, if we're really lucky, we'll get another one and it will probably be right about INL level, which is where the Idaho National Laboratory, um, which is where we have the highest concentration of nuclear reactors in the country. So that was a good place to put that. Turns out there's not a lot of good places to put (laughs) nuclear Uh, there was also, Anne had asked, she looked into earthquake pre-eruption and plotted 3D as it showed two pipes. I think, have you looked at the current eruption right now at all in geophysics or uplift in Iceland? Oh, yeah. Um, no, I have not looked at the um, the geophysics at all. Uh, but the, th- yeah, so I don't know how far the two pipes might be apart, but there's certainly two vents right now. They're very close. I mean, they're, you know, maybe they're like 50 feet apart, but um, I, if, if that's, maybe that's what those two pipes are doing now, they've sort of narrowed down to two vents that are pretty close, but yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't looked at the, I very much concentrate on the blobs coming out of the top and not what's happening <laughs> below. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. It's all happened. I just watched those drone videos like you. I'd mentioned that's pretty sweet. Yeah. You can fly a lot better than I can. Well, yeah, I guess there's some reason to practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, sorry, I didn't go off on GSA talks or like you know, I obviously talks with people flowing right into a lava. Yeah. <laughs> Gone. Um, I wonder what that does to the chemistry. Um, so the last question is is your dog named Spatter? <laughs> uh, my dog is named Marcy. <laughs> okay. Sorry to intrude on that. Yeah. No, um, Okay, good. I think that has all the questions uh, that we've had asked. I really appreciate you taking the time. That was a great talk. And thank you. Thank you so much. Good luck down in Moscow. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And I will try to find that paper and send it to you so that you can distribute. Okay, fair enough. (laughs) Will do. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Erica. Bye. Bye.